You know, in, uh, in the study of truth, we believe that God is everywhere present and that there is an ever availability of good. This is really the foundation, I think, of the science of mind teaching. God everywhere present and there is an ever availability of good. Now, in science of mind, it is also true, and we teach that life is a state of consciousness, that you are, you have, and you do in accordance with your consciousness, because the principle is, as within, so without. So unless we change our state of consciousness, nothing else can change. Why? Well, because we always get the conditions that belong to our consciousness. Now, you can try through willpower to drag some, something to you, you know, something that actually does not belong to you, but you can only keep it for a short time. Because the moment you take your hands off it, the moment you take the energy and all that it takes to keep that there away, it disappears. So this is why we must have the consciousness before we have the thing. See, people often have that reverse. They want to have the thing and say, oh, then I'll build the consciousness. Oh, yeah, that's it. I have the thing, and then I can create that consciousness. And it's like, you know, that's, that's not how it works. You have to create the consciousness first before you have the thing or the person or the experience. So all of the time we are trying to work on outer things uh, and, and, and leaving our consciousness unchanged, Really, if you think about it, no permanent good could come to you or me from that. Now, in the Bible, when they're talking about a valley, that almost always stands for trouble. It stands for limitation. It stands for error belief. So like Moses, though, each of us, we have to go up the mountain. We have to rise in consciousness and be open to a greater spiritual truth. Why? Because that greater spiritual truth will allow us to be more free, right? It's not necessary to uh, get caught up in the lower, I want to say the lower vibrations of the world. Um, you know, we don't have to be angry or mean or disrespectful or bitter. That doesn't add an iota to us. That's not going to increase our consciousness or make our life better in any way. God means for all of life to be uh, noble and creative and joyous for every one of us, I believe. Now, what you associate yourself with is what you are bringing forward into your own consciousness. Now, yeah, in the Science of Mind teaching, we, we love the books that Ernest Holmes wrote, so we read those books, right? And maybe we take some classes. I certainly hope you do. And Eventually, we even start to do our own spiritual practice, which is where our life really will start to see change. We meditate, we pray, you know, but after we do all that work, we take class, you know, when we're meditating and praying and we're reading the books, it's your life that is actually the laboratory where you put all of this that we are learning and, and talking about, where we put it into practice. And what I mean by your life is your everyday existence, the people who were there with you, the experiences that we're having, the things that we're learning, the places that we're growing. Oh my gosh. You know, for many of us, this past half year is probably the strangest, most unusual year of our existence, at least so far. You know, we are used to a life, it seems to me, of enormous freedom. And we are being asked to, you know, pull back a little to think, of the greater good for everyone. And, and so I would say the first thing about that is that I love that we are thinking about the greater good for everyone. I think that's really important. We know that to just think of ourselves, you know, no man is an island, and if we're just thinking about ourselves and what's good for me, that, that's not really a very conscious way to approach things. You know, there are many paths to God. I get that, I, you know, there are many paths home. And science of mind is one path. We're not claiming it's the only path, but it's one path. It is a real path. And we want this uh, teaching to really, really get into us. We want to so embody this that we cannot help but just naturally experience a shift. You know, every one of us knows, I believe, that there is more to life than the everyday normal consciousness, don't we? I mean, it seems like everybody knows that 
we know there's a little more than this, or maybe a lot more than this. And so searching for that, searching for the more, I think comes from a very deep place within us. It comes from a place of spirit. It comes from a place of God. I think it's really important when things are going well, when things are going well in our life, for us to notice, notice what? Well, what have we been thinking? What have we been doing? What kind of spiritual practice have we been engaging in? What kind of conversations have I been participating in? What have I been watching on TV or on the computer? What have I been filling my mind with? What are the books I've been reading? When things are going well, we have to pay attention. See, people always want to get, when things are bad, they want to get in and muck up in that, muck around in there. And it's just as important to investigate when things are going well. What am I doing? Because that's the consciousness I want to keep perpetuating. The thing is, success leaves clues. And so if my life is going well, I must be doing something or some things that are in accordance with spiritual principle. And if my life is not going so well, I must be in some way not paying attention to spiritual principle, to not really working in the most intelligent way with the principles. So ask yourself, when have I felt happy and joyous and free, right? Because I think we all have. We've all had times where we were just incredibly happy, where we were joyous, where we felt such freedom, no restraint. What was going on then, you know, when it went right? See, this is what we have to ask ourselves. Whenever anything goes right, what was going on? You know, in, in, I think in the Western part of the world, we tend to focus more on what's going wrong. And we do love to get in there and investigate that. But I believe when it goes right for us, when it goes well, we have gotten out of the way and we've let God be in charge. See, because if you look at those areas of life that work really well for you, somehow you manage to get your personality self out of the way and let God be God. Remember, God is the highest and best within us. I'm not talking about a power that's separate or apart from us. I'm talking about our true self, our higher self, the spirit of God within us. So, you know, to let go and let God is not easy for most of us. You know, can I, can I possibly consider letting God be in charge of every moment? I think, well, no, I can't do that. This is what my human personality says. I cannot do that because what would happen to my life? What would happen to what I want? Well, here's what would happen, really. You would be happy, you'd be joyous, and you'd be free. Yeah, I honestly think that we think that if I give God full sway over my life, if I invite God into every single area of my life, I somehow, I'm going to lose. I'm going to lose something that's important to me. That is crazy, crazy thinking, I'm here to tell you. You know, it's time to have a greater notion of God. If you think that God is going to, you know, diminish you in any way, you have a a puny, small-minded God. Just cash that God in right now and get yourself a big, loving, abundant God because that's the God we have in science of mind. Think like the force in Star Wars, but add lots of love and intelligence to that, okay? God does not want to limit us, okay? That's not God. That's like, I don't know, the evil school principal in fourth grade. I don't know, that's not God, right? God wants to fulfill us because God gets to be more of itself by means of our expression in the world. You know, so it's, it's not about restriction, it's about blossoming. See, our consciousness is, is, is actually being used for something higher. And I think we will always live in happiness and joy and freedom when we live in service to the creative genius that's within us. That's what spirit is trying to express. And I believe that that's true, that there is a unique creative genius in every one of us. And we want to live in service to that because that's what spirit is here trying to do by means of us. Why would I not want such a great experience? Well, I've, I really thought about this and and it seems to me that it feels like a death to give up control. Mm -hmm. It does. You know, like, what would happen if we said goodbye to who we are, you know, to who we used to be, and really opened up to all 
of who we could be. No, oh, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I need another six months. I need another six years, right? We have a lot of experience of our small self. You know what I mean? That small, separate, human personality self, and not as much experience of our expanded divine self. See, I'm more familiar with the small me. I'm more comfortable with the small me. I know it very, very well. And I resist sometimes what I have been praying for. I mean, that's a real confession on my part. You know, you know when you pray and then you doubt? You say, oh, I gotta go back and I pray some more and I affirm and then I doubt, you know? So, so that's, that's really um, the small me. And, and, and that's the small me resisting what I have been praying for. But when we step into a larger expression of life, which I believe every single person is capable of doing, we are free we get free, and so does everyone else, because the principle involved is that we are all connected in the one mind. So when you do anything that lifts up your consciousness and makes your being more joyous and free, that actually is a blessing for all of humanity because all minds are connected. We teach that. It seems to me that when we try to break free, there's usually a big lesson. You know, there's some kind of growth opportunity, a trial. We might experience some depression. You know, in enough pain, though, what I realize, at least for myself, is that when we're in enough pain, we will actually really let go. You know, there's that pseudo let go. Oh, yes, I'm letting go. And, and that's not really letting go. But when, when it hurts, it's like, you know what? I have got to get out of this. I don't care what the principles are involved. I am willing to incorporate them into my life if I will get healed and free. See, because every problem comes bearing its own solution. We believe that. It's like it says in our textbook, if God ever answers prayer, God always answers prayer. And so it can seem at times like we are powerless in front of the darkness, that I can't do this by myself. Well, Ernest teaches us that there is a power for good in the universe, and you, you can use it. You can use that power for good to lift you up out of condition, to not be at the effect of circumstances, and you get to use that power to define your experience and say, regardless of what's happening out here, this is who I am. This is who I am as a spiritual being on Earth. So we, we get to feel it all, you know? There are no shortcuts. People often ask me, well, you know, if I'm so spiritual, not me personally, but if they're spiritual, why do they have these, these uh, emotions that they don't like? Why do they have these bad feelings? And, you know, there's nothing enlightened about denying what you feel. In fact, the way to get over what you feel is to feel it. Imagine that. To feel it 100%, embrace it. I know it's not the truth, but this is what I'm feeling now, and I've just got to feel it. And then, once we felt it, then you are free to move on. You know, but if we spend all our time denying it, denying it, no, I'm not sad, I'm not sad, I'm not in grief, I'm not lonely, I'm not this, I'm not that, then it's, you know, what you resist persists. So everybody gets their own life curriculum. Everybody gets a curriculum that's filled, it seems to me, with, with joys and infinite possibilities and, and also maybe some challenges, you know? But I was thinking about this, and I heard this years ago, oh my God, decades ago when I first came into metaphysics, and I've always loved it, that an oyster <clears throat> will get a grain of sand inside the oyster, and that grain of sand acts as an irritant to the oyster. And what the oyster does is the oyster makes a pearl out of that grain of sand. And I think this is what we're supposed to do when an, a growth opportunity comes in our life, we are to work on that spiritually. We pray and we meditate and we forgive and we do thanksgiving and all of those practices that we do again and again and again to enable us to take the raw material of our life and turn it into a pearl. You know, crucifixion is always followed by a resurrection. And I know for many of us now, it feels like we are in one big, big crucifixion. But know that the resurrection is coming that the light always follows a dark night, that fear is always followed by love. And so I think like Jesus, we go through it with our hearts open. This is the challenge. Can I do this with my heart open? See, now belonging to and having a community I think helps keep us afloat. You know, so this is why when you talk to your friends and when you're Zooming with people and stuff, say, hey, pray for me, I'll pray for you, could we do that? Hey, I'm thinking of you. Just because something is challenging doesn't mean it's not what's supposed to happen. 
You know, that's what gets us to the place where those challenges are less and less and less to the point that they don't occur anymore. I think of it like this. When I first came into metaphysics, my life was very much a series of great highs and horrific lows. And I'd go from a really horrible, horrible low to the next great big high, and then another low after the high. And it was a lot of that ping-pongy kind of thing. Now, after a lot of time with the teaching and practice, I find that I don't go as high, and I certainly don't go as low. I'm kind of middle high. Most, you know, I mean, that's where things operate. You know, so ask yourself, does God need to suffer? Think about that. No, of course not. God does not need to suffer. Where is God? God is within me, therefore I do not need to suffer. I felt for a long time like things on earth are speeding up, like the lessons are coming faster and faster. And, and so I think, all right, we, we have everything we need within us to create a life that we absolutely love. And we have everything we need within us to create a world that works for everyone. Let's turn to that now. Let's pray. So we turn our attention inward for a moment, remembering that we are surrounded and filled with God's infinite loving spirit, that the spirit of the living God that's everywhere is right here. It's the most true, real thing about each and every one of us. We are the sons and daughters of the Most High God. And in this awareness of our connection, I speak the word for each and every one of us that the way out is through. I'm certain that we have everything we need within us, all of the spiritual resources, all of the love, all of the intelligence we need to get the most out of this experience, to heal what needs to be healed in our life, and step into our largeness, the largeness of spirit that we are. I know that we allow the creative genius within us to have full sway of our life and that there's no area that we keep separate or apart from God because we know that our life is the very life of God. So we include in our prayer today our family members and friends and parents and children and grandchildren and nieces and nephews and everybody we love and hold near and dear. And we see them in our mind's eye. And they are surrounded with a mantle of God's healing energy, a mantle of peace and love and abundance, every good thing. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world that we live in. So all that pulls at our attention, it's all just the world of effects, that beyond all of that, there is a spiritual truth that is love. There is a spiritual truth that makes us free, and we embrace it. And so we bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God, even those paths that don't look like paths. We bless them all. Because I know in this magnificent universal soup that we are all in, it's all God. And so with an open, gracious, full heart, I give thanks, I release this word, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen.